Right, well, I think we'll get started. Good evening, everyone. And um, welcome to the first King's Expert series of this academic year. My name is Felicity True, and I'm from the King's Alumni Relations team. And the King's Alumni Office works to engage and partner with our global community of alumni. And we offer you a range of benefits from events online, in person, and in your local community, as well as opportunities to volunteer your time. If you'd like to get in touch, you'll see the details on the screen, so please do get in touch. Every year, we live stream this webinar series featuring our King's experts, so we can share King's world-leading research and cutting-edge technology and offer you the chance to hear direct from our researchers and practitioners on some of the most important issues of our time. At King's, we believe in a world where people can enjoy peace and healthy lives, where they can coexist with a thriving environment, a world where background doesn't limit opportunity and where innovations benefit everyone, not just the select few. Today, our first event will explore new technologies developed by our very own King's experts and explore the role they have in developing our understanding of the mind and body. In the first part of this webinar, we will hear from our stellar panel of experts before opening the floor to you for questions. So please do submit any questions that you might have via the Q and A function. We will also be live streaming and recording this event to audiences on our YouTube channel around the world. So whether you're watching live or watching the recording, welcome. Without further delay, I'm absolutely delighted to hand over to our chair for this evening, Professor Jackie Sturt. Head of Division of Care in Long-Term Conditions and Professor of Behavioral Medicine in Nursing, who will introduce her, herself and our panelists and start tonight's first King's Expert series of the academic year, Professor Jackie. Thank you, Felicity. And it is a great pleasure to be here with you this evening. When the panelists and I um, met in order to discuss this, this evening's event, we agreed that there'd been very few or no new technologies in mental health care, psychiatry for, for many decades. So we're really thrilled to be able to present several new technologies to, um, around mind and body to you this evening and taking it from the science to the practical application of, of that science, which is what technology is. We'll start with the science and we're going to all of us introduce ourselves and our technology. We have one slide each, so you'll just have a few slides to begin with and then we'll get into a really good discussion. So I'll start with me. Thank you, Felicity. You've introduced me. And my new technology is actually not so new. Um, it's neuro linguistic programming. You may have heard of it. You may refer to it as NLP. Now, this technology has indeed been around for about four or four or five decades, um, but it's completely unscientifically explored. So what I'm what's so my technology that I want to present to you tonight is really to put neuro linguistic programming. I'll just call it NLP. It's a bit easier to say, put NLP under the scientific microscope to see whether have following decades of um, you know, very cautious approach to it from, from the scientific uh, community, whether it does offer us something very significant in uh, mental health care. So just to talk you through uh, my slide a little bit, we start on the right hand side. So this is, the, this is the, the theory of NLP. We start with an external event. Uh, I've just given you here a dog, an ambulance and a person running. And these events happen. They are sort of objective events. But what happens is that we, the mind takes the brain, takes this event, this external event, and it filters it. So if we think about the dog, I'm on a beach and a dog is, um, is, is running on the beach. Now, I might delete uh, parts of that, of that image and I might delete the part that shows me the dog attached to a lead with its owner and instead see a dog running at me. I might distort that that image, that external event, um, and see the and, and instead of seeing the waggy tail, I might see a thrashing tail in an aggressive way. 
And then I generalize from that external event and, and the filtering that goes through in my brain uh, and generalize it to all dogs are going to be aggressive and running towards me and therefore fearful. And some of the time, space, energy, matter that you can see those words on the screen, those are ways in that con the, those contribute to the filtering process. But what happens as a consequence of this filtering is that we make an internal representation uh, and this is really the memory. It's pictures, sounds, feelings, smells, tastes, what we say to ourselves about that experience. And those all change the way our body responds when we have a, um, a, a somewhat similar experience. So we might, next time I see a dog, I might go into the either the fight, the flight or the freeze mode. I might, my skin would flush, my hands might get clammy, my, I might get palpitations and that um, that re um, leads to a sort of a, a very highly aroused emotional state, which in turn affects my behavior, and my behavioral choices and the outcomes. So the outcome of this whole entire experience, this external event, may be that I don't uh, go to the beach because that's where dogs are. I don't go to the park where dogs are um, because that's where dogs are. I avoid any situation in which I might come across a dog, which limits my social interactions with the world um, and so forth. So that's the theory of, of NLP. Now, I'm, as you can see on the screen, I'm interested in uh, looking at NLP for, from as a therapeutic approach for post-traumatic stress disorder. So hence my examples of being, um, of being sort of fearful, traumatizing experiences. Um, but that's, that's the technology I want to introduce to you today. So let's move on to um, Professor Georgina Ellison Hughes, who's going to tell us about, introduce herself and tell us about her technology. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Professor Georgina Ellison Hughes and I am a professor of regenerative muscle physiology. So I am interested in my research on understanding um, how the heart and the skeletal muscle repairs and regenerates. Um, and I'm particularly interested in how we can prevent and treat uh, the loss of muscle mass that you see with aging uh, and or, or disease. Um, so my technology focuses on, uh, for, for, for this um, uh, particular webinar, I'm going to be talking about the tech, one of the technologies that I use, which is um, human cardiac organoids. Now we can grow these, um, these kind of organoids of the heart uh, within a, in a Petri dish. Um, they, uh, we can, uh, what we do is we start with a stem cell, a human IPS derived um, cell. Um, which and then we differentiate this into cardiomyocytes and you can see here on the screen we have uh, um, some pictures of these organoids or these spheroids um, if uh, Felicity wants to start the video you can see that these uh, differentiate into cardiomyocytes they actually start to beat so that's when we know that they have differentiated and then we can carry out some immunostaining and we can show that they have the, uh, the protein expression for the different cells in the heart. So they express cardiac troponin, um, they express NKS 2.5, which is a cardiac transcription factor for a cardiomyocyte. And also within these uh, organoids, we also have other cell types that are present in the heart, which are the vasculature cells. So you can see here some staining for von Willebaum factor, which is an endothelial cell marker. So what we're able to do is we're able to then closely replicate the architecture, the structure and the function of the human heart in a Petri dish. And then this gives us a really good platform so that we can study disease. And also one thing that we're doing at the moment um, to, with uh, funding from the Centre for Ageing, Resilience in a Changing Environment, which is our, one of our new research excellence centres at King's, um, we are studying uh, the effects of aging and a particular hallmark of aging um, within these uh, cardiac organoids um, where we're able to target, target particular cellular aging processes and test different drugs to see if we can um, counteract the effects of aging in the heart. Um, so there we go. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Georgina. And now we'll move on to introduce Professor Oscar Marin. Marin. Um, please, Oscar, um, tell us, introduce yourself and tell us about your technology. 
Um, hi, good evening. My name is uh, Oscar Marina. I'm the professor of neuroscience at uh, King's College uh, uh, London, and, and I'm particularly interested in understanding how the brain uh, develops. And uh, we are, you know, today I want to introduce um, uh, some of the technologies that we're using, and I'm kind of glad that Georgina actually introduced organoids uh, before. Um, so it's essentially the same uh, concept. We are using the idea that you know uh, in the embryo from you know we start from one cell and you know it contains all the information to create all the organs in in our body the heart and and the brain and we are using uh, this principle the idea that cells uh, contain all the relevant information to build the different organs to um, essentially use uh, these cells to create a piece um, of uh, one of our favorite organs in this case the brain um, in culture, in, in an in vitro uh, system. So we essentially use the information that the cells have to cell aggregate to form these three-dimensional uh, structures. And we just provide the right you know, amount of guidance uh, for the cells to differentiate in this case into a piece of, uh, of our brain. Now, the um, uh, amazing advantage that this gives us is that uh, for the first time, we can you know, uh, move away from animal models or we can begin to understand how this process of brain development happens in, in us, in our species, in, in humans. And we can, uh, this way, begin to understand some of the things that actually make our brain um, uh, more complicated and different than um, other species. And I'll come back to that um, maybe later in the discussion. But part of uh, uh, the interesting bit is that we can start these organoids, these kind of avatars of, of our own brain, from adult cells, from you know a cell, from a, for example, from the skin of uh, a, a, a child, and then essentially create um, you know a model in miniature of a piece of their brain um, in vitro, and you know that allows us to study you know particular disorders, but also the normal physiology, the normal uh, context in which a, a brain uh, develops. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Oscar. Uh, and our final uh, expert to introduce himself, Dr. Johnny Downs. Johnny. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to try and tie a little bit of that together. So my name's Johnny. I'm a, I'm a child psychiatrist. So I'm down the sort of more clinical end. I'm a senior clinical lecturer based at the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. So Georgina and Oscar have, and, and Jackie have introduced quite varied technologies. This is a program of work which is being led by uh, Gronre McClellan and uh, Katie Long. Um, essentially, which I'm part of, which is essentially taking um, what would understand as a preclinical, as, as Oscar and Georgina have discussed, the, the, the organoids, as it were, um, to fix a certain, or to look, to start looking into a particular problem that was really identified over, um, over the course of uh, the pandemic. What was understood is that we knew that the interuterine uh, environment, uh, when mums were infected with COVID, was having an, a, an impact on neurodevelopment at a child in, in, in the, the child developing in utero. We didn't really understand what was going on and what was happening in those processes. Um, the work that they've done has demonstrated the fact that you can understand from looking at fetal tissue, from potentially growing these the, the um, early uh, progenitors of, of, of brains, to actually understand how um, the vasculature of, of, of um, these developing brains are starting to maybe look slightly atypical when they've been exposed to uh, uh, um, COVID vectors, as it were. What that's done is then say, well, what really became a, a clear problem during the pandemic is we didn't really understand what was the downstream effects, particularly of these infec infections on the mother and child's immune system, how that immune system then got into the brain, how then the brain then changed in its development, and how then we were able to see what the eventual outcomes, the real world outcomes. It's fine if our brains change a little bit and don't look completely typical. If there is a typical brain development, what's crucial for us is then, does it start to have functional outcomes later on? So the program of work that I'm interested in is, and being part of is, is taking these sort of preclinical and cellular examinations to look at what happens to the microvasculature, the, the neuroanatomical folding of brains, which you can pick up uh, through these very sort of um, in, um, uh, detailed uh, granular technologies, um, uh, taking uh, scans, uh, the, the very high granular MRI scans, then start to understand actually what the 
pathological processes that might be displayed. Oh, people talk about phenotypes, things that you can actually observe in the child. Are they paying attention in the right way? Is there emotionally are they are they are they emotionally responsive as a, as one might think? And then to start to use the sort of technologies that we have, like wearable devices, like some of the EEG, EEG technologies, like some of the eye tracking technologies, to really get much more of a fine grained understanding of these potential pathological processes and then whether they actually end up presenting as problems as a clinic. So that's the pipeline that we're developing. And the key aspect for the work that we're involved in is that the legacy will be if we have another event, God forbid, if we have another event where we're looking at big systemic changes in, 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 in an exposure to a particular viral element or, or, or some other sort of event in the population, we can actually then have these systems that can be able to track the outcomes quite rapidly and also the investigatory tools to be able to get at what the mechanisms behind the problems uh, that we're later on likely to see further down the line in clinic and schools. Thank you, Johnny. That's uh, uh, excellent and such um, such really um, engaging science that we've we've presented. And please all start. I'm going to ask some questions uh, of our experts and uh, of myself. Now we're going to have a discussion about some of these things. But please do remember to to um, you know write down your own questions because we we will get to those uh, in in a sh in a short while. But first, I'm going to to start by asking um, Oscar. So if you think about your technology, Oscar, and the journey in front of, of that technology, so that it sort of makes a practical application to human health, what does that journey look like for your technology? Well, first we need to, um, I think, uncover a bit more of the general principles that govern uh, brain development and you know how human brain development uh, uh, occurs. But, you know, it's a kind of a low hanging fruit or immediate uh, um, uh, type of applications. We know, for example, that a very large number of, of syndromes uh, uh, are caused by specific mutations, variations in uh, specific genes that, that control uh, brain development. Now, with this uh, technology being able to reproduce uh, uh, these mutations in human neurons and see how that actually impact brain development, is it's very immediate. And um, uh, you know, we need to learn how these uh, uh, variations actually affect the process of building uh, a brain to be able to identify ways in which we can actually uh, tackle uh, tackle this. So, as as a way to probe essentially what you know those genetic uh, changes are, um, uh, how they are acting, how they are changing the way a brain uh, uh, normally develops, um, this technology will be very uh, uh, very very informative. Thank you, Oscar. And Georgina, how does that differ if it's the heart we're talking about and not the brain? So for me, um, it's more about kind of modelling disease or or, um, or ageing in a, in a Petri dish. So we're kind of interested in drug discovery and understanding the effects of ageing on the, on the heart. And so we can um, apply certain things to... Um, the organoid culture, so that we're able to study the effects of something on those on on those organoids, and then we could maybe discover drugs. Um, we could discover um, different targets, if you like, from from our um, investigations that we do at the different at the protein level or the or the transcriptional level, and then we can um, target those things um, and see what then happens to to the organoid. Um, the next step probably for cardiac organoids are for them to become more like the, the cardiac and more like the heart in situ. That's a really difficult thing to do and to replicate in a Petri dish because you're working with um, cell types that are still very immature and they don't actually model the adult um, heart. So it's it's good for Oscar because he's working on development and like um, brain development and neurological development. And um, so he wants to maintain that that kind of phenotype of the cells. Um, but for me, I would rather have something that was more kind of um, similar to an adult phenotype. And also when I think about aging, um, that's even uh, something else that, that, I, that I need to add to it. So. 
So for me, um, it's one of the challenges of the of the technology that we we have to um, bear in mind as a limitation when we're working with with the technology. Um, but it's it's definitely improved because it obviously allows us to work on human on human tissue, which is really really important for translational medicine. So is there what's the length of time that you can keep your organoid cardiac organoid alive for, uh, so that it you know, you get more maturity than the maturity that you want. Yeah, so we can keep them alive for quite a while. Um, they can probably go on for about, two, about eight weeks or so um, before they might start to, to deteriorate. Um, but um, the, the maturation, we will never be, we can't get back to, um, we, we can't mature them into an adult phenotype in the Petri dish. We, we have to go to like this thing called a decellularized tissue. So we have to introduce some extracellular matrix because the heart is, it has this scaffold of matrix that keeps it all together. And that matrix is really important for signaling and things like that. Um, so in order to, to do that, we'd have to move into that kind of thing. Those, those things are, are existing, but it's still really difficult to do it, you know, within the confines of a, of a, of a Petri dish, but, but eventually maybe we, we might get there. Yeah. Thank you. And um, that question to you, Johnny, what does the journey ahead look like to get to the real translation into patient care place? Uh, well, I mean, I'm not going to be able to answer Oscar and Georgina's question in terms of the, the, how you go from an organoid to a, a clinic straight off. Um, I mean, I, what I will say is that what they're doing actually is it enables to us to, to develop a lot of families come to us feeling they need a sense of hope, not just about the hope that their child or, or their, their family system are, are going to improve, but to, to know that there is scientific applications that is enabling us to understand better the conditions that they're in, the difficulties they're currently facing, and to know that there is proper applications in 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 properly getting back to these very preclinical stages so that that's that i think that's one thing i would say is that a lot of the work it does provide us with a lot of enthusiasm and optimism and, and areas to talk about especially when talking about things like drug development and understanding uh, better these mechanisms for my work it is largely and the, the work that i'm involved in is thinking about measurement and how to get better measurement i i as a as a, as a well as a science and i don't want to put us down but I think, as we said before in our discussions, Charles Cartery hasn't really changed fundamentally in terms of its treatment and its assessment practices for 50 years. I mean, we are essentially a, 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 a talking uh, therapy, uh, an assessment to get information that is observed or is, is self-reported from young people and, and the people around them, people that care for them. And that is very re reliant on subjective experiences. And that's very important. What we're trying to do more is to think about how we can how we can couple that with more objective markers to this idea of being able to not rely on a young person all the time to tell you about their sleep, but actually also have it chronicled in an objective in, 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 and hopefully in a low burdensome way in terms of passive sensing and, 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 and those types of measures. We don't have to rely constantly on fairly subjective opinions from the clinician about what the emotional intonation of a voice might be like, we can actually start to now rely on those particular um, machine learning paradigms that we're picking up in terms of getting auditory and emotional signals from voice. We don't have to rely necessarily on people bringing scraps and pictures and, and, and videos themselves of their, or with them with their child on birthday parties. We can actually start to think about routine collection of, of these particular tools into practice. So they are able to give more reliable witness and more contemporaneous witness to events that have happened over, over the course of their child's development. I would say the key, the key aspect, so there's lots of people get that as a kind of idea, as a phenomena. The difficulty is, is this adoption. And I think the, the kind of the nervousness about introducing new technologies into our profession, and we're not a I'd say as a as a as a, an organization of professionals, I'm not saying parents are particularly reluctant. I think parents are often driving these things, and that's why the patient voice is so important, the young people. But what we're struggling a little bit with is the reluctance to change clinical patterns of measuring, of talking, and these things that we've historically been trained on to say, let's give this a go. Um, and and to cope with the levels of uncertainty of that extra what that extra information may bring. Yeah. So I, 
that's that from a replied end that i say is probably our biggest adoption difficulties in terms and, of getting technology into practice and that really resonates with me because one of the for my technology with nlp that's had 40 years or more of kind of suspicion around it, where it's been described as a pseudoscience by the, the community and it hasn't had the scientific scrutiny, changing the hearts and minds of, of professionals really in relation to adopt, you know, adopting that new, that new therapeutic approach to mental ill health is, is my, one of my biggest and my colleagues' biggest challenges also. You know, it, we, we can't just provide evidence on on these measures that you're you've been talking about the the questionnaires we can't just provide that that evidence that this seems to work or this definitely does work um, because that's where we're heading towards those those trials to really put it to the test one of you know but a, a really big part of it is understanding how it works and if it works how it works and that's going to involve um, a, an awful lot of understanding of a sort of cognitive neuroscience and doing some imaging to see what happens to the, the brain when you're undergoing these technologies. And, and that's going to be one of the, the biggest sort of challenges I have, which is also about adoption. So, you know, the, uh, there's some interesting chartered waters for, all, uh, for us all ahead in, in taking our technologies to, to that place where we know and feel we're, we're very um, convinced that it's worth doing. As, as experts in our field, um, but these things are not without challenge. So thank you all for those that introduction to, uh, to your technologies and the pathway. Um, so Oscar, we hear lots about personalized medicine and personalized healthcare. Um, can you tell us what that means in general and how it applies to your technology? Oh, well, I think one, you know, one, Good way of understanding this is is again going going to genetics, which perhaps help us to you know narrow the problem. That was the problem is is way um, wider than this, but you know genetics help us to understand this. And you know one example is that there's a number of syndromes that are caused by um, mutations again by variation in specific genes. Um, but when when it comes to the clinic, we know even that uh, kids with you know mutations in the same gene um, not normally you know, very frequently don't show exactly the same uh, problems, the same symptoms. There is large variability in the way, um, you know, a particular, you know, genetic uh, alteration uh, manifests in, in kids. And there's a, a, a large number of reasons why that could be, you know, sometimes it's because the uh, variation in, in the particular gene is not exactly the same, you know, when you compare it to kids. Um, but very often is also the other genes, the, you know, the, the rest of our genome that, you know, in some cases compensate, in, in other cases uh, do not help uh, in kind of buffering for that uh, particular change. So there is a, there is a very important need in, in to try to understand in a very personalized, in a very, you know, direct way how, you know, a particular change in, in, in our genome may absolutely impact, for example, in this case, the way um, our brain is uh, built. And that is, again, a little bit of the beauty of, of the technology, because you can essentially take a, you know, a cell from the skin of, of a child and reprogram that, you know, now relatively mature cell to, you know, to be embryonic again, and then start over the process of creating a, a piece of the brain specifically from that individual. And, you know, that way you can essentially create this avatar of, of you know, or in the little region of the brain and begin asking questions very specific to that individual. So it, it does offer, you know, the amazing capacity of being able to narrow down the questions and, you know, make it in the context of the particular um, uh, individual. Um, from my, my perspective, I think that is going to be transformative. It's going to be a game changer because it allows us to, you know, to to look at things in a lot more detail in the context of the genetic environment that that particular individual uh, has. And I think that, you know, that applies to brain development. It's going to apply to your genius, you know, heart and, you know, many other uh, type of problems. And we need to continue on this road of, of uh, trying to understand, you know, in this case, for example, brain development, more generally, but at the same time, kind of uh, uh, how each of, and one of our brains, you know, in a, you know, in the context of 
individuality, how each of our brains is uh, built. And, and in that this type of technology is beginning to offer the possibility of exploring it uh, from that perspective. Thank you. So um, your work, Oscar, and yours, Johnny, is, is centering around children. And um, so, you know, uh, Johnny, what, what do you have to, you know, what are your thoughts about um, what Oscar's telling us? Well, loads, loads. I mean, uh, just briefly in terms of the, the, the personalised medicine. And again, we've not we're not there yet. I mean, personalised medicine currently in the practice. Well, when you talk to some people, some people and, 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 and this is completely understandable that we are delivering personalised medicine. You come to see a therapist and someone that assess you and you take a very nuanced uh, line of inquiry and line of, of, of eventually treatment, depending on what they're presenting with. So we are offering through a human approach, very personalized, and that will look different to every particular problem. And also that we use kind of still very crude diagnostic constructs to be behind, you know, one person's oppression is not another person's oppression. Oppression at the age of um, eight is very different to the same child with the depression at the age of 12. It, 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 you know, so we are, our lamentaries, our, our, our categorizations are still pretty crude. And I think one of the things what we're really hoping as, as time goes on and we are able to enable better, more granular measures of people's sleep, of people's sort of um, of movement, of, of, of these basically, th these these phenotypes, these objective markers of phenotypes, we're actually able to get better characterization of, of what their problems are. And also we're gonna get better sensitives, sensitivities in terms of their responsiveness to various therapies. Currently, we make a choice around what i'll just take medications for example currently we make a choice around what the adverse effect profile is going to be like ultimately most of the medicines that we give for certain for broad categories of diseases have the same sort of efficacy it doesn't really matter which one include what we do tend to pick is actually whether they're going to get what, what, what are going to be the likely adverse effects and how well that, that is tolerated by the, the, the young person and how tolerated it is by the family system around them. I think one of the one of the chat, one of the wonderful what we'd I'd love to be able to say is taking, let's say, well, Oscar is able to prevent, say, look, if you give us some information about yourself and some cellular information that we can develop, we might also then start to be able to look at what particular medications, what type of sort of um neurochemical environment is appropriate for you given your particular makeup your genetic makeup and also probably your neurodevelopmental makeup i mean uh, the ability of uh, it's, uh, if we were able to do that in clinic it would be an incredible incredible thing and it would be it would be it would it would um and and it is i mean oscar and, and it, it, it's not quite within our grasp immediately but it does look like that that is the uh that is the line of direction sorry no no i was just gonna say you're right johnny it 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 Basically, you're able to make these models that we work with patient specific. So you can take that person's, um, Oscar alluded to it, you can take, you take the skin of the patient, you can then transform that skin fibroblast into a stem cell. And then you can take that stem cell and then you can differentiate that stem cell into the cell of choice, whether it's a, a neuron, um, or a cardiomyocyte um, and you can then and then you can make these organoids and then you can look specifically at that patient's cells so they are aligned to that patient they come from that patient so that's one thing that these technologies are good at is that you can make them patient specific and that's why they're really good for studying things like genetic disorders because that genetic um uh, you know, the information that you have genetically will be retained usually in, in those cells. So uh, so that, that's one of the good things about these technologies and makes them very personalised. It's very expensive, though, because, you know, we can't, we can't make organoids for everybody. But, yeah, it is a, but, is an advantage. Well, I was just going to uh, thank you, Jordi. What I was going to say as well is it's, I mean, we're talking about, Oscar and I are talking about brains, but but crucially, a lot of the adverse effects, the, the medications that we give have an impact on on a, a whole array of other um, organs within the body. So uh, you, you, the ability then also to be able to say, well, is this, but it, it's one of the things we can concern about is, is cardiovascular health with some of the medications we give. 
and, it, and we it is literally a trial and error. We are, ask a little bit about family history. We're not at the process where we can look at really genetic signals to be able to dissuade us whether we should give a particular um, uh, medication. Or we have to send them for um, you know, um, echocardiography and things like that, which where we know we're still missing. But what we'd really like is the ability to be able to say, is your heart going to be particularly responsive to this type of um, cellular hijacking, which is essentially what medications do. And is that, are we going to see, is, is that a way to be able to differentiate whether we could start at lower doses or whether we should be more cautious of prescribing or to try different agents? And I think, I mean, that's what I'm really optimistic about the work that these guys are doing, how it will eventually in the, you know, not just the diagnostic processes, but also trying to start thinking about how we direct therapies. So what does this brave new world look like when we can have, when everybody can have an organoid? <laughs> you said we can't have them for everyone. They're expensive. They're expensive now. You know, how many decades will it be before they're a lot less expensive and you can go and make your own? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> It's not, I don't know, it's, it takes, it's not simple, is it? It's not a simple uh, technology. You need to be skilled to do it. Um, I think it, I think it's, I think it's just a way of leading us to understand um, about how things happen at the organ level and then, um, and at the cell and molecular level. And, and then that can lead us, you know, to obviously trialing different um, things and therapeutics in, in the translational sense, in preclinical models, and then eventually in clinical trials. And I think that the thing that they can do is that they can provide an evidence base, which is what we all want, isn't it? When we are thinking about planning clinical trials, we want to have an evidence behind why we are why we are planning our trial like that and the design that we're doing and the patient group that we're looking at and the outcomes and the inclusion and the exclusion criteria and i think that by using all these cellular and molecular systems that we develop we'll be able to give us that evidence base and we'll be able to get obviously there quicker so i don't think it's a, pro a, pro a process of having an organoid for everybody um i think it's is using the technology to make sure that we we guide our, our clinical studies and our translation in 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 the right way with with um with good strong robust evidence behind them hmm. thank you so i think now it's time to open up the discussion for some questions from the floor yes, jo, i was just to quickly you. add to, oh sorry but the cost of sequencing the first human genome cost three billion, um, it, and 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 now we're at the point where it costs less than a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's it's quite difficult to also predict how how quick things are in the course of a five years. But also it's quite difficult to know how quickly things can come in 10, 15 years. Yeah. So it, it yeah it all depends on how much energy people put behind it. I think. Mm -hmm. And funding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Energy funding. It's a, it's a, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Felicity, some questions from the floor. Well, actually, since we're on the topic of organoids, we've got um, several questions around organoids. So um, I'll just put a few questions together. But we've got how accurate are the organoids to model disease? And then other questions are coming in. Are organoids such as the cerebral able to be personalized to a person's genome? That's specifically for you, Georgina. And then can you put in simple terms what the process of differentiation is to go from cells to organoids? And finally, do I understand correctly that you can take skin cells and differentiate them into cardiac or cerebral organoids? So there's a lot of questions there on, on organoids. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. <laughs> shall we shall we go to Oscar um, first for your you can choose which one of those questions you'd like to answer? Well, I, I, I think the the process itself, um, as I you know, uh, tried to explain at, at the beginning, it's it's essentially um, hijacking the ability of embryos to create uh, organs. And, you know, the fact that they contain all the relevant genetic information to be able to develop them, you know, from the egg into you know multicellular organism and eventually into different organs. So what we what we essentially do is to either start with an embryonic cell or 
you know, an adult uh, cell that we can reprogram, we can kind of, um, you know, change their time clock and, you know, return them to an embryonic state and then provide the um, media, the factors that they need to direct themselves to, to become, in, in our case, um, neurons and, you know, other cells of, of the brain, in the case of Eugenia, to, to become um, cardiac uh, muscle uh, uh, cells. So we just provide the environment and, and the cells have the, uh, let's say, self um, organization uh, required to aggregate you know, in three dimensional structures, those little uh, um, balls that you, you can see in a petri dish and then begin to uh, to grow. Georgina has, in, in the case of the heart, they have the difficulty that they fall apart if they are not sustained. Uh, for the brain, it's quite remarkable. We can keep them for years, literally for years. We can, we have organoids that we have developed for months and months and, and they keep, you know, they don't become, you know, very big. They, they maintain more or less their size. Um, but the challenge for us now is to to mature them into, uh, you know, as close as possible to to what you would expect to see in, in a neonatal, in, in a prenatal uh, uh, period, which is, you know, nine months of our life. Um, um, but essentially, we are just using the ability of the cells to self-organize and to create the same structures that they normally do in, in utero. Thank you, Oscar. Georgina. Um, okay, so similar to what Oscar said, so you can you 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 take um, you derive these cells, and we don't work on embryonic stem cells. We work on um, induced pluripotent stem cells. So you take a, a skin, you can take a skin fibroblast from a patient. And then you can instruct that skin fibroblast to go back to being a stem cell using different molecules and, and different um, programming strategies. Uh, and you can do all of this in vitro in, in, a, in, a, in a Petri dish. And then once you get it to become a stem cell, then you put it into a defined media um, whereby it can you can propagate the number of them. So you can increase the number of them so you have more stem cells. And then you can use those stem cells and you we basically use these agarose um, kind of uh, uh, inserts whereby we, we, we put our cells, our stem cells into these agarose inserts and then they grow like in a ball in a spheroid. And then we are able to take them out of these agarose inserts and put them in the Petri dish where then they grow even more. And we put them in a defined media that makes them turn into a heart, heart cell. And then after about, you know, eight to 10 days, they start to beat. And, um, and then we can go and we can look and see what kind of uh, cells are within, within the organoid. And like Oscar says, it's a self-assembly thing. They self-organize themselves. Um, and they differentiate themselves into the into the into the cell types that make up the heart. So you've got the vasculature cells, you've got the cardiomyocytes. You can also populate your your organoid with stromal cells if you're interested in seeing like the extracellular matrix that I talked about. Um, so that they've got some kind of interstitial um, a tissue there as well. Um, so you can make them how you want them to be made, basically, and 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 you can model them how how you want them to be how you want them to be modelled, um, and that's effectively how it works. Thank you, Georgina. Johnny, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean that was fascinating. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've never grown one of these, um, as you might understand. I mean, I just think I was maybe a question to just to follow on a little bit was. I mean, one of the things that was really valuable about the work, the, the COVID work, that I can understand is that there are some some processes that seem to stop quite early and actually reach almost a full maturity relatively early, especially around things like the choroid plexus, where you can sort of start to introduce what would be, you would know, be able to emulate what would be, you know, exposure to to um, viral you know, viral agents and see what the antibody response might be. And you can almost say that that is probably what the cellular processes that are going on for that fetal brain at that time. And because they go on, oh, because they occur at a time when 
the quarry practice is pretty well formed, even though it's very early stages, one can extrapolate what the difficulties then may be uh, further uh, maturational difficulties further on. So there is also something about being able to introduce, uh, you know, uh, to get causal processes in, introduce these sort of um, toxic events uh, in order to be able to really understand the mechanisms. And that's uh, 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 for, for, for people that are interested in neurodevelopmental science, that's fascinating because we know that there are lots of interuterine insults that have a real impact on actually you know, a, a child's um, school readiness, for example, five years down the line. So that's what's um, very exciting about the work that they're doing. Thank you. Felicity, do you have anything else for yes. us on the floor? We're having lots of questions coming through, which is wonderful, but there's lots coming in about the ethical impact of the work and healthcare equality. So questions such as what is the main ethical dilemma that your technology creates or may lead to in the future? Um, do you believe these technological advances will be able to replace animal experimentation, be more relevant and applicable to humans and therefore be more ethical? And then finally, thinking about the healthcare equality, personalised healthcare systems often turn out to be cost enhancing. How would its applicability worldwide be possible, low cost and excessively effective? Thank you. So... Um, I guess there are always uh, ethical discussions around the use of stem cells. So, um, Oscar, do you want to take tell us about what you think about yeah, that? Yeah, I, I can take two of those questions. Up. Uh, the first one is is relating to, you know, in the case of of growing brain organoids. Um, there's obviously um, always the concern to what extent you're eventually going to grow something that looks like a, a you know, entire human brain and whether, you know, your organoid is going to acquire consciousness and that sort of, you know, that takes you into that that direction that perhaps you don't have if you're growing a liver or, or, or a heart or something like that. Obviously, our brain and our mind are, you know, one of one one of the theme and 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 that leads into that sort of, of discussion. It's important to notice though that, you know, we are building small little pieces of of the brain which is completely disconnected from anything else um so it's never going to happen that uh, these uh, organoids are going to acquire you know in that sense you know self-consciousness obviously um but it's they are really critical for you know we've been discussing about you know how little progress we've we've made in in terms of you know trying to fix uh, uh neuropsychiatric problems over the last 15 years and part of the reason is that we we really don't understand quite well what goes wrong in these conditions. We just simply don't know how our brain changes during development that actually make it either more resilient or less resilient to um, to events later in life, and and you know eventually lead to a pathology. So we really need to understand how human brain develops, and you know, and I think in that sense there is very little little ethical uh, complications. Now, the other question is around animal research, and I think there is no doubt that, you know, uh, our ability to integrate the human brain directly, either through these um, lab experiments or through, as Johnny was describing, more better technologies to acquire data from uh, from the brain using non-invasive uh, recordings. I think that all uh, that is going to uh, help us to, you know, reduce the amount of animal work that, uh, that we do. Um, that being said, um, there's nothing that can replace, you know, a fully formed, you know, uh, brain that we can study in great detail uh, in in an animal and that we can actually link to um, a particular behavior and the way that an animal uh, uh, behaves. And that's why, uh, for example, the laboratory mouse is so uh, fundamentally important for us to understand how brain development links to the emergence of function and and behavior. So. Even though we are developing these technologies, I, I think that we are still going to need to rely on on animal experimentation for very specific uh, questions that are more linked to uh, to the emergence of function and behavior uh, in particular. Okay, so in relation to, I, I think we talked about personalized medicine and um, and whether or not you know we can have an organoid for everyone and you know the, the fact that that might be expensive or it might get cheaper um and whether you need whether everyone anyone everyone needs to have an organoid their own organoid in order to you know have per, complete personalized healthcare. um 
And then, uh, Georgina, you talked about, well, it's about, you know, how you design the trials and your patient populations mm -hmm. to go in to, to, um, to develop these new therapies, uh, you know, associated with, with, with what we know. Does that mean, and so where I'm going with this is, do we need to have clinical trials taking place at, in different parts of the world with, with patient populations, with different genetic you know, profiles, different sociocultural experiences, um, rather than all, you know, in one place with one particular group of, you know, more, more homogenous populations. And, and, you know, how can what you do at, at King's, um, what do we have to do to make that absolutely applicable in sub-Saharan Africa? Okay. Georgina, <laughs> I was giving the hard questions, do I? <laughs> I'll look at it, Johnny. Um, <laughs> you can start and then we'll move to Johnny. <laughs> okay, so I think what you're trying to say to me is maybe um, it could be about using these technologies to stratify patients uh, or people into trials. Is that kind of what you're asking me? I think. Yeah. Well, I'm sort of thinking about the healthy, uh, healthy qualities, uh, you know, angle to to it really. Just picking up on on what I think the question was about, um, in, in making sure that what we're doing is going to have global, uh, yeah, global you know possibilities and and impacts, health impacts. Yeah, okay. So, I, I mean, I think that, oh, this is a tricky one for me. Okay. <laughs> well, like, maybe Johnny wants to. Uh, <laughs> Johnny. Johnny, help me. Yeah, no. <laughs> one of the real difficulties that we have is that because our, we're so cultural bound, certainly in understanding neurodevelopment, understanding how, what, a, what is a good or, or, or a not good outcome, understanding about how we define um, distress and psychopathology. Um, it has meant that we really do need to do, continue keep, keeping to do cult culturally bound ethnographic work to really understand exactly what a what, what is warranted to be good as a good outcome across the world. And, and, and you can't just say one particular intervention because it seems to be providing a good outcome for this particular group in South London or and and historically we've not been good we've tended to recruit people that are convenient samples that are um uh, essentially sort of white middle class offspring of academics that's you know the child psychiatry is peppered with that um and then when we try to translate those particular findings into lower middle income countries we actually have cultural resistance saying well, what are you doing why are you measuring things in that way and why are you pursuing a particular outcome or also we don't we don't culturally tailor our particular interventions very well. So I, I, I mean, in summary, what it does point to the fact that you if you if you find an internal validation and you find something works in in Peckham, you can't then just assume it's going to work in um, in areas of Eritrea. You just you can't. But you, what you do need to be able to say is that we need next to see how we can scale and how we can move these um, these technologies elsewhere. One of the things about measurement is that, and certainly around objective measurement, is that the idea is that they're less culture bound. So one can start, if you use these as, as, as other outcomes, so if you look at sleep, or if you look at, you know, just activation, behavioral activation, how much get up and go someone has, and you've got fairly objective measures and markers for that, it potentially does provide us with the ability to be able to say, well, it is unlikely to be too culture bound, this particular good outcome, Therefore, I think we can make an assumption that it may, depending on if we, we depending on what we're doing, but we 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 may be able to actually measure the same thing. So there's can there's less measurement invariance, which is culture bound. But the, the other crucial thing is, is that, I mean, I don't know whether this is the right thing to say. Is that I presume that these technologies that you're talking about, um, to ask, is that they're not particularly culture bound. That they are obviously there's going to be resource implications about how they are used and applied in other parts of the world. And, and they do need to be, those eth ethical questions do need to be kind of navigated. But it, you are not, depending on your racial makeup of the samples that you're using, are going to be prejudicial against one particular group or the other. No, which is why it's difficult to answer that question as a, as a, as a cell biologist. 
But you're offering some reassurance uh, um, to, to the question that um, to the, you know, the, the person offering the question that we don't have to replicate the same science in all over the world. The, the science that's carried out at King's at this level um, has a general a generalizability across the yeah. globe. Yeah. In terms of cell and molecular. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Felicity, do we have any more? Well, I thought one, one last quick question, um, which is to think about the future. Um, if we could instantly implement one radical change in your industry, what would it be and why? And how can we inspire senior medical leaders to be open to adopting new technologies? Just very quickly on that hopeful future note. <laughs> Who wants to put their hand up and, and, uh, and answer that question first? <laughs> Oscar. I can. Okay, oh, Georgina, no, great. Yeah, go. I, I was just going to say one thing for the future for us is to understand, well, for, for, for me, is to understand things like um, the effects of, of aging on, you know, on our, on our organs and is particularly on our heart. And, um, and new things that are really exciting that are being developed are the use of microgravity and uh, sending cells into space and um, and culturing on the International Space Station because that is um, that's where you have an accelerated aging uh, phenotype because you are without gravity. So um, that's something that's really exciting for the future for us is in uh, in thinking about how we can utilize space and um, and taking our our technologies uh, into a microgravity environment and seeing the effects of those, which is obviously important for the, for the aging, but also it's very important for future space travel and space tourism as well. So, yeah, that's um, that's something that, that that we're thinking about. Thank you, Georgina. Johnny or Oscar. I, well, I mean, it's, it's a, <laughs> there's implementation challenges of taking preclinical to clinical and then into clinics. Um, it, you know, it's a big question, an age old question, and it depends on the application, et cetera. I mean, one thing just in terms of generalities, one thing is demonstrating you're fixing a problem that really needs to be fixed. And I think what, what from, from uh, you know, from my profession in terms of thinking about, we don't have particularly good understanding of mechanisms. We know that we're in the dark and families in the dark about why some of the problems are presenting the way they're problems. And if you don't really understand mechanisms, you can't be confident on treatments. I mean, that's basically it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what is very compelling about what Oscar and Georgina are thinking about is that they get us closer to understanding mechanisms. And one of the quick, quick problems, the problems that we might be able to fix is this idea of the trial and error, especially around adverse effects, where you might be able to understand quicker about whether something's going to cause harm to a particular organ if you give it to that particular person. And at the moment, we don't really have any models other than trial and error at the moment to do that. Thank you. And I, I um, concur with that. I think from my work, it's understanding mechanisms. Um, just just being able to say something works is not a compelling enough, um, you know, to change the hearts and minds, to change the behaviours of, of uh, healthcare systems and, and providers. And it's understanding the mechanisms in the, the therapies that I'm interested in will be really important. Last word from you, Oscar. I mean, from my perspective, you know, I, I like what Johnny says, and, you know, we, we need to keep an eye on, on trying to fix things that need uh, fixing. And, you know, in, in, in our context, uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of uh, very early onset uh, syndromes that, that cause, you know, um, very difficult to treat epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And that typically evolves into creating many other problems, including, you know, cognitive problems and, and mental health uh, issues later in life. And if we were to understand, you know, how that very early onset epilepsy, typically within the first weeks of months of, of life uh, comes about, and I think that is probably, an, I would say, an easier problem uh, to to understand and to fix than you know more complex uh, mental conditions. Mm -hmm. um, that would already, you know, over the next 10, 20 years, that would already make uh, uh, you know uh, maybe yeah. really happy if we were to understand how each of these conditions arise and 
and begin to identify treatments that very specifically will eradicate this early onset epilepsy that it's uh, so um, thank you uh, thank so you difficult so, yeah yeah, yeah. So thank you all. I'll hand over to back over to I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. I certainly have. And I'll hand back over to Felicity um, for the her final words. Thank you so much, everyone. That was really fascinating. I mean, obviously, I know we're just a bit over time, but I just want to say a huge thank you to our chair and to our panel of experts for sharing their expertise and to you for joining us tonight for such an engaging discussion. You know, we, we always appreciate your feedback. So please complete our quick event survey via the QR code on the screen now. And all there is to say is have a wonderful evening and look out for our next King's Expert series that will be taking place on Monday, the 25th of November, where our panel of King's Experts will be discussing AI, quantum and micro technologies in healthcare. So the registrations will be opening soon by the King's Expert website. Thank you to all of our speakers tonight and thank you to all of you for joining us and have a wonderful, wonderful evening.